John chapter 13, um, verse 31 is kind of where we left off. It says, therefore, when he, this is Judas, was gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified. God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, a new commandment. I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So Jesus now <clears throat> in the upper room, Judas has departed. If you look in uh, verse 30, it says, he then, having received the sop, went immediately out. And, and that's in an active sense, by the way. He's the one who went out. Uh, predestination did not drive him out. He went out. And there, when, therefore, when he was gone out, again, that's active. Then Jesus says, and he begins to speak. And he's going to take us through these chapters up to the end of chapter 17. This is holy ground, as it were. These chapters not found in any other Gospels. And John is writing 60 years or so after this, like he's still sitting there that night. you know. And he said, when the Spirit comes, I'll bring all things you remember. So certainly that's happening in John's heart and mind as he puts the quill to the page. And he writes the last things Jesus had to say to them. You know, I'm, I'm going to depart. You can't come with me. But I want you to listen to these things that I'm saying. You know, he gives them a new commandment. Uh, he gives them a new coming. He gives them a new commission. He gives them a new comforter. He answers questions that you and I might have. Peter has a question. Thomas has a question. Philip has a question. Judas, not Iscariot, has a question. And it's just so interesting to watch him interact. And finally, he lifts his heart to the Father. And that's where we really have the Lord's Prayer in chapter 17. But here, there's almost a sigh of relief. Judas Iscariot has gone out. Now the Lord can begin to talk to his disciples about the most important things on his heart this last night before his crucifixion. Now he can establish the Lord's Supper. And John is just reliving. He's the last apostle alive, and he's thinking of this night. And it says in verse 31, when he was going out, it says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. The, the idea is not just through him, it's in union with him. They're together in that. If God be glorified, the first class condition, that should be since God be glorified in him. God shall also glorify, future tense, him, it's going to happen, in himself, and shall straightway glorify, future tense again. Um, it says now. It's interesting. Now. The idea is in that word, it's kind of something that's already begun. He's saying it, the, the timing of it from that word is the wheels have begun to turn. His glory is now coming to the fore. The traitor has gone out. The, the time now is beginning the time. The time in eternity, human history has been waiting to see. It was established before the foundation of the world. Now, he says, is the Son of Man glorified. And by the way, those are passives, the first three. He doesn't do it. This is glory that's coming upon him because of what he's going to do upon the cross and his resurrection and so forth. He, he says, now, wheels are turning. It's happened. Son of Man glorified. Father glorified in him, in union with him. Since the Father is glorified, 
then he will glorify future tense himself. And it says immediately he's going to glorify him. And that's the emphatic phrase, immediately. No other time. It's going to happen immediately. It's going to happen now. This is when it's happening. And Jesus is telling him, look, yeah, Judas has gone out. There's going to be betrayal. I'm going to be handed into the hands of sinners. I'm going to be beaten beyond human recognition. I'm going to be brutalized and crucified. But there's glory in all of this. And all of this is going to happen to the glory of God. And it is his glory because God will be able then to reveal something of himself that w had never been seen before through the cross in time or eternity. So he lays that foundation. Now the glory of God is being manifest. This is becoming reality. This hour of my passion that's come, the wheels are turning. And then he says in verse 33, little children, yet a little while I am with you, and you shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, the remarkable verse in the sense that he addresses them as little children, technia. It's an endearing term. It's a, a, a term of great affection. It's a fatherly love. It's something you, you call your kids, technia. It also insinuates a level of immaturity. And he's looking around at them, and John is still thinking about it 60 years later. What was the look on his face? What was the tone of his voice? As he said, little children. Peter's older than him. Well, Peter must have been... You know, to get this carpenter younger calling him a little child, you know, and he was, by the way, you know. And John is so touched with this term, he's so reliving it in the four Gospels. The only place this term is used is here in John, this one time. But when John writes his first epistle, he uses that term seven times. Little children, I write unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Seven times you'll hear him use little children. He finally ends by saying, little children, avoid idolatry. And John, this old, old man, writing to the church, and he's addressing it to little children, little children, so much in the spirit of the Lord, so much remembering, no doubt, that night, little children, yet a little while I am with you, understands what's coming. You know, how does a father feel leaving his kids? You know, he, he knows what they're in for. You're going to hear him pray about that in John 17. He knows what they'll face. They're all going to be martyred, except John. You know, he looks at them, he calls them little children. I remember being on the West Coast when 911 happened and my wife calling me saying that, you know, we're under attack and so forth. And you're thinking, what? And you start to see what's going on. And you're thinking, Lord, can I get home? Is this going to precipitate in the World War III? My kids, my wife, you know, and you feel so far away. And here, he calls them little children. You imagine that the father, the pathos in his heart as he says that again piercing John's heart, causing a memory. And he's getting ready to step away from them. He says, where, where I'm going, you can't come. You can't come. He says, you're going to seek me, he tells them. That's their love for him. And he's aware of that. You shall seek me. And as I said unto you, to the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come now is emphatic. We don't know if it's you cannot come now, which would corroborate verse 36. When he's talking to Peter, he says, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Usually if it's emphatic, it's the first word or the last word in a phrase. So is it saying, you cannot follow me now, which is understandable, or is it, I say unto you now, and then moving on in the thought. Jesus had talked to the Jews, and he had said the, these things to them. He said in chapter 17, as 
he goes into this portion. It's in 17, I promise. He said to them, little children, no, I'm sorry. He's not saying that to the Jews. Yet a little while am I with you. And I go to him that sent me. You shall seek me and shall not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersion of the, among the Gentiles to teach his Gentiles? What manner of saying is this? You shall seek me and shall not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews perplexed at it as he says that. And then it tells us in chapter 8, when it goes over this, it says in verse 21, it says, Then Jesus again said unto them, I go my way. You shall seek me. Now he makes it clear. You shall die in your sins. Whither I go, you cannot come. So that's vastly different than what he's saying to the disciples. He's saying, I'm going. I know you're going to seek me. But where I'm going, you can't come now. There's a pathway that goes through the cross, and I have to go there alone. That will have nothing to do with you. It's like... Abraham and Isaac, the great picture of Golgotha, where that actually took place in the cross. It says, Abraham and Isaac left the servants behind and they went on alone onto the same mountain because only the father and the son could settle what needed to happen there. So he says, you're not coming. You don't understand my pathway. They didn't understand Gethsemane, Golgotha, Gethsemane, the Gabbatha, Golgotha, the grave, the glory, the things that were laid out. They didn't understand all of that at this point. So he says, you can't, I know you're going to miss me. You can't come with me. You need to understand where I'm going. You can't be part of that. But then he gives this commandment. If you look in verse 34, he says, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. <clears throat> that ye also love one another. Now, several things about this. It's a new commandment, he says, not chronologically, like new in time. It's new in measure. It's new in nature. It's fresh. It's something new in that sense. It isn't new that he's telling men to love one another. In the law, in Leviticus, he had said, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any or nor bear any grudge, are you listening? Nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. There it says in the law, thou shalt love thy neighbor. Jesus is saying you should love one another. John's going to use it and say love the brethren, not your neighbor. He says you should love your neighbor. Then he says this, as you love yourself. That ain't hard for any of us to do, is it? As you love yourself. Jesus said that you should love one another. And what makes it new is he says, as I have loved you. As I have loved you. And, you know, we listen to that and think, well, I can never do that. Well, you can on your own. He's going to tell us about the Holy Spirit in the next chapter. But understand this. He says it's a commandment. He says in chapter 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He commands us to love one another. Now, if that's something we can't attain to, the question is, is Jesus naive? Does he have unrealistic expectations? He's God. He's divine. He's come from eternity. And he said, I want to give you this commandment that you love one another and you do it as I have loved you. So you should love one another. He's not talking then about emotional love. That's great when that happens. You're wrong with that. He's not talking about philanthropy, just helping others. You know, that's fine, but they fall so short of what he's speaking about here. 
He's telling them that they need to love one another in this new way, this agape. It is willful. It is not just feeling. It is something that you can do because he commands you to do it. It's a decision. It's intelligent love. Superior to the faults of its object. This love is superior to the, to the, the fault of its object. Aren't you glad? It was superior enough to love me and all my faults. It is never foiled or discouraged by the unworthiness of those upon whom it has been bestowed once and for all. Never discouraged, never foiled, never turns back. John Christosom, one of the church fathers, said, this is a love that is not owed. God's not loving you because he owes you something. It is a love that is not owed. And he says this to a world, understand the conditions in Jesus' day. And as we study through the Gospels, we, we understand some of that, this Roman world distinctly separate from this Jewish heated environment in Jerusalem and Judea. This was a world divided in prejudice. There was Jew and Gentile, there was master and slave, there was male and female, there was Greek and barbarian. And this commandment's being given from Judea, the narrowest, most bigoted, most intolerant nation on the earth. And in the middle of that comes this commandment, not a suggestion. You need to love one another as I have loved you, so you should keep loving one another. There are present tenses there that tell us it's for us today. You need to keep loving one another this way coming from Jesus. You know, I, I look at it and I think the, the love that he's talking about here is so important because look, the last few years, you know, I'm 41 years teaching the scripture here now in the church. Know you, know you when you were a kid, some of you, some of you I dedicated. Some of you know, I'm three, four generations in your family. And I watched as that time came with COVID. There was separation because of that. We didn't know what to do with it. Then the election, Trump versus Biden, and people in this church, first service and third service, we're saying things to one another online that were so mean and so ungodly because our kingdom is not of this world. There, there were the racial tensions that arose again and people in this church said things that should never have been said to one another and it caused division separation. Then there's the vaxxed and the unvaxxed. And if we're going to be a good testimony to the lost world, we need to wear masks and we need to be vaxxed. And if you're not willing to do that, you're a bad testimony. Well, this is going to say something different to us. In all of that division, we know that if we're going to love one another as he has loved us, his love has forgiveness. He, his love that loves me is a forgiving love. I don't know about you guys. I'm glad about it. Because that's the only kind of love that can love me. You can think of someone, a Christian, this is one another, probably in your life right now that you need to forgive. You don't want to think about them, Pastor Joe. Don't make me think about that person. Well, forgive me for making you think about that person you need to forgive. Because we're offended in the body of Christ. We're hurt. We're betrayed sometimes. And when you love that person, he's giving you a commandment to do that. You have to do it with a forgiving love. That's the way he loves, as I have loved you. That's what's new about it. And then people say, well, I'll forgive, but I can't forget. I agree, you can't. But he doesn't tell us to love that way. He said, with the love that I have loved you with, 
God can forgive, but he can't forget he's God, so he chooses not to remember. Your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. He can't forget he's God, so he chooses not to remember. And when you're with that person and you know you, you, forget, you need to forgive them, you could say that stuff, I can forgive and I can't forget. That's not how God loves. God forgives and chooses not to remember. And because we're all imperfect, we've got to do that. And this is not a new suggestion. This is a new commandment. It's volitional. He asks us to do it. It is a sacrificial love. It, it is not based on the worthiness of the other person. There's a cost to the, lo the one who's loving. There's a sacrifice. There's something given, bestowed. Do we love people that way? It's a covenant love. We make a promise. We have covenants today in marriage and in child raising and different positions we get involved in. His love is a covenant love. It's not going to be broken. He's made a covenant. And we have to make up our minds sometimes to love one another, and this ain't going to change. It's not going to change. Importantly, it was a representative love. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Henceforth, say no more, show us the Father. He was representing the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The love that was immeasurable, that the world had never known. The world had never seen in its existence in time and eternity the love that was demonstrated of God on the cross giving his own son. And the love that we are to love with is a representative love. As I have loved you. It's representing him when we love someone. It is a love that is not a prejudice love. We know that from Revelation chapter 5. Because around his throne in that day, those whom he's loved and forgiven sacrificially made a covenant love with are from every nation, every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, every race around that throne. And at that point, their commonality outweighs any of their differences racially, you know, their heritage, their language, the object that's being worshipped makes all those differences pale. And we need to love one another that way. If you have a problem with someone of a different race, a different language, you have a problem. It doesn't belong here. This is supposed to be the place that's different than everything that goes on out there. Love one another the way he's loved us. There's no excuse for it. We can have background, we can have hurt from the past, we can do all that, but with a forgiving love, with a representative love, with an unprejudiced love, we can love each other that way. I had a guy come in during COVID when we first started to meet again, sat over there, beard, 40-ish, came up and talked to me after the service. <clears throat> and he said, I'm not a believer. I said, well, wait, why are you here? He said, don't give, I started talking about Christ. He said, don't give me this spiel. He said, I know it. I've heard it over and over. I'm not here because of that. I said, well, why are you here? He said, because the world out there is so messed up, so divided, so hateful, and I come into a place where everybody's on the same page. And he said, I don't believe what you believe, but I just can't believe that you all believe the same thing. <laughs> and he said, I just come because it's refreshing. He said, I can rest here because nobody's going to kill each other here. He just, you know, and I pray for that individual. You know, I'm hoping that uh, I see him in heaven or I see him again here. Look, um, It's a challenge for us, but if it wasn't possible, 
he wouldn't command us to do these things. Um, and there's something that you and I have to be careful of because Jesus, in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, when he's talking about the last days, in verse 12, he says, in the last days, because iniquity will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And what he says there is the agape of many will grow cold. And he's not warning unbelievers there. In the last days, because iniquity will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Don't let it happen here. The world out there is disintegrating. It's filled with hate. Oh, the world loves its own, Jesus. But, but it's not real love. It's not a sacrificial love. It's divided. It's violent. It's prejudice. It's immoral. And sometimes you and I, we watch how crazy it is, and we just say, Lord, just blow the trumpet and burn them up. Lord, just get me out of here, and they want to go to hell. Let them all go to hell. You know, we can, our hearts can become hardened because iniquity is abounding. And the danger is that even our agape can grow cold. Please don't let it happen here. Please don't let it happen here. John, the oldest living apostles, the only one still alive. They called him Bronto Faunos, Thunder Voice. We always think of John as this meek and mild. No, he had said, Lord, call down fire on the Samaritans and cook them, you know. And him and his brothers, they started to call it. Jesus gave them the name Sons of Thunder. And in the last days of his life, they would carry him into the great church in Ephesus where he was the elder. They'd have to carry him. They would sit him down up front and he would say, little children, love one another. And that's all he would say. He was living in this passage. He knew it was possible. Little children. Love one another. And there's great purpose to it. It isn't just without being linked to something. Because he says in verse 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love and as if you continue to have love for one another by this. Now, by, by the way, that the this by this, this is singular in the Greek. The idea is by this one thing shall all men know that you're my disciples. By this singular thing. It's possible to be a Christian and not show this kind of love. We can sin against this kind of love by misrepresenting the Lord. And we probably all do at times. I, I, I have a, my prayer journal at home and I have the names of about seven or eight people <clears throat> that when I say, it's a forgiving love I don't necessarily want to think about. They've all stabbed me in the back. They've all hurt me. <clears throat> Their names will be in the bulletin next week. No. <laughs> but they're written in there, and, and I try to pray for them. I try to pray for them. Because I know this love that I've appreciated is a love that died sacrificially for me. It's a love that is praying for me at the right hand of the Father right now. And it is a love that's coming back to get me. He said to his disciples, I'm leaving. If he didn't leave, he couldn't come the second time. And he says, while we're waiting, we need to be loving each other. And he says, by this, this is the thing, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples. It's really, Sad to hear someone in the church, sometimes a new believer, say, my unsaved friends treated me better than I get treated here. Now, sometimes they're just a complainer and they need to go back and check it out. But, you know, how sad when someone says that and they really feel that way and they really mean it. You think what, what's missing is telling us to do this, not to say we love one another, 
but to love one another. We make the mistake so often of making faith the test, the mark on our lives. And the outside world looks at us in regards to what are we doing? What are we looking at? Look, we make faith the test. He says here, by this, no, this one thing, not doctrinal statements, those are important. Not the music, the worship, not rituals and ordinances, not our you know, soul winning zeal. Those are all things, not our missions. He, he, he says this one thing, by this thing shall all men know you're my disciples, by the love that you have one for another. In other words, all those other things are important, but somebody should be able to walk in here like that guy on Sunday morning and say, something's cooking here, something's going on. Look at this crowd. These people do not belong together. <laughs> Look at them. And for us to be here and worship, for us the fellowship that breaks out at the end of the service, the care and the concern, 380 folks adopted for Christmas. I'm so thankful by this one thing shall men know that you're my disciples. I'd encourage you today, and we're going to pray about this tonight, that God would make us better at this. The body builds itself up in love. Every joint, every ligament supplies. The health of the rest of us depend on each one of us. Even Peter, you know, would say, Lord, how many times do I forgive somebody? Seven times? And the Lord would say, no, Peter. Seventy times seven. Unendingly. I mean, forgive. Four, you know what four means? Ahead of time. Forgive means you make the place ahead of time to be obedient to this commandment to love one another the right way, forgivingly, sacrificially, unprejudiced, just coming in and representing the one who's marked and touched our lives and come to dwell inside of us and who's told us that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, it wasn't faith. He said, he said you know, if, if, I, if I can move mountains, I have faith to do this. And he said, but I have not love. I'm a noisy gong and I'm a clanging cymbal. And he takes you through that whole, so what if you don't got love? Describes love. And then at the end he says, now these three abide. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We can have faith and we should have faith. The Lord tells us to have faith. What's the point if we don't love one another? We can have hope. We can argue about prophecy. That's a big thing to argue about all the time. But what about love? You know, Calvary Philly some of us have been here together for a long time. Some of us sometimes can take for granted what God's given us in fellowship and in friendship and in worship and in studying his word. Some of us can just come in, oh, don't sit over there by them, you know, they drive me crazy, you know, just, you know. So we, we, can, we can kind of be here and be segmented and separated and, you know. This is a commandment that still holds true today. It's in the present tense, keep loving one another. Is it easy? No. But each experience in life, each stage as we live, there should be more of Christ in us. We should be doing these things better in our obedience to his commandment. You know, at 72, I can just see back further than I can see ahead at this point. So I know I'm gonna be seeing him one way or another. In the, I pray it's the rapture, but one way or another, I'm gonna see him before a lot of y'all are gonna see him. So the things I wanna make sure are right in my heart, because I'm gonna be seeing him soon. 
one way or another. I would say to you, after all of these years watching all the division that's come, all that Satan wanted to bring into the church, all that he still wants to bring in, all of the tension in our culture, little children, love one another. Let's stand. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for the person on our right, whether we know them or not, Lord, that you would bless them, Lord. That we would love them, the person on our left, Lord, whoever they might be, Lord. Maybe a spouse, maybe a friend, maybe someone we know that we would love them better. Lord, we bring before you in our hearts, Lord, those who have offended us, those who We don't have forgiving love towards my own life, Lord. Lord, those we don't have sacrificial love for, those places where we're not representing you, Lord. Places where there's still prejudice in our lives, Lord. Overcome all of that with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Let love be the mark of Calvary Chapel, Philadelphia, Lord. Let, let love, Lord, be the mark of all of that as it is the mark of great revivals through history. Let it be central and powerful and poignant, Lord, and recognizable here. It's a divine work. We look to you, Lord. We say amen to your commandment. Let it have our hearts in better ways, we pray in your name. Amen.